sparkle in the sky around the world and over the seven seas. From the Mediterranean to the Pacific, from the Arctic Ocean to the China Sea, the Navy's flying fleet is our vanguard in the sky. For today's modern Navy is a world leader in aviation, flying the newest, most modern aircraft yet developed. These sleek carrier-based jets, swift and powerful attack bombers, agile helicopters, and giant flying boats all make up the Navy's mighty air arm. And the men who pilot these planes go places fast. As global flyers, they truly see the world. Well, that does it, France. My last flight in this one. Where next, Lieutenant? Sunny Italy, that's where. No kidding. That's what the orders read. A jet squadron operating in the Mediterranean. No kidding. I'll send you a postcard. All right, sir. One Navy fighter plane now in need of a skilled pilot. The Navy has him, trained and qualified. Throughout the various operating squadrons of the Navy Air Arm, the process of personnel reassignment and replacement is a continuous one. As one pilot completes his tour of duty with a squadron and is transferred, another is on deck, ready to take over as junior man on the team. To man this flying boat and the thousands of other planes in the fleet, the Navy recruits, trains, and equips a constant flow of young Americans who will become the finest aviators in the world. It is here at the Naval Air Station, Pensacola, Florida, where the young collegians who have been accepted for flight training begin their transformation to combat-ready Navy pilots. Located on Florida's beautiful Gulf Coast, Pensacola houses the headquarters of the Chief of Naval Air Training. And here, I hang my shingle. One man out of many helping to keep this never-ending training process on the move. As personnel officer for the training command, a part of my duty is to make known to young Americans interested in aviation the Navy programs through which they may earn their Navy wings of gold. In the Aviation Officer Candidate Program, or AOC, one needs an accredited college degree. As a NAVCAD, or Naval Aviation Cadet, you need only two college years. But regardless of which program a man is qualified for, both result in a Navy commission and a chance to fly with the world's greatest fleet. Gentlemen, you are now members of the United States Naval School of Pre-Flight, which is divided into three departments, the academic, athletic, and military. We shall begin with the military. Form a column of twos. Follow me. Thus, life as a student naval aviator really begins. Rooms are assigned. For the NAVCAD and the AOC, a cadet room for four while the officer student calls the bachelor officer's quarters his temporary home. Physical exams are thorough and leave nothing to chance. A more complete checkup would be hard to find. And after that, Navy clothing issue removes the last outward trace of the civilian. Then, almost before the student realizes it, Indoctrination ends and pre-flight begins in earnest. Sure, Dad. The food's great. What? What do we study? You really want to know? Okay, Dad, you ask for it. Airology, engineering, flight physiology, naval orientation and leadership, navigation, principles of flight, Study skills, character guidance, phys... Yes, Dad, character guidance, physical fitness, and survival. Total, 543 hours. 
No, Dad. Spread over 16 weeks. Compressed is more like it. But spread out or compressed, a pre-flight course provides a thorough background in all subjects essential to flight training. Like the student of medicine, the potential aviator learns about the innards of his aircraft before he operates it. The vagaries of weather and atmosphere are explored and defined. The mysteries of celestial spheres and Earth coordinates are dispelled. And shooting the sun or the stars comes more logically and easily after a visit to the school's planetarium. What makes an airplane fly? Why does it turn, dive, and climb? They're all questions which are answered for the student in pre-flight. In the same way, naval orientation teaches the student many of the details of what makes up the Navy. And to make all this learning stick, the Navy's reading rate controller makes it possible to consume more knowledge in less time. And in the physical fitness survival phase of pre-flight, two aspects of aviator training are stressed. Development of muscular coordination and survival under emergency conditions. In illustrated lectures and realistic practical exercises, all known survival techniques are passed on to the fledgling flyer. Physical fitness and the spirit of teamwork are further stressed through participation in competitive sports of all kinds. While in the military department, staffed by Navy and Marine Corps personnel, the pre-flight student is given a lasting indoctrination in military courtesy, bearing, and administration. Sixteen weeks pass, and then one day the student finds himself putting that extra shine on his shoes in preparation for the pre-flight graduation ceremony. For the NAVCAD, the completion of pre-flight is not so much a conclusion as it is a beginning the start of his actual flight training. And for the AOC student, the graduation takes on added significance, since it is also the day he earns his Naval Reserve Commission. Then in the next phase of the student pilot's career, primary training at an outlying field, the big moment seems at last to be at hand. Actually flying a naval aircraft, that is, it's just around the corner. First, it's back to the books for a short but complete course in the training devices which familiarize the student with the workings of the primary training plane. After a blindfold cockpit checkout and a simulated parachute jump from a ground bailout trainer, the big moment really does arrive. The student meets his flight instructor and takes his first ride in the front cockpit of the T-34 Mentor. Okay, all set, Higgins? Roger, sir. All right, Higgins, start the engine. Higgins, I'll now read off and execute the checkoff list for the correct warm-up procedure. Now ease back on the stick and bring the nose up gently to the takeoff attitude and let the aircraft fly itself off the deck. Do you understand that? 
Roger, sir. Higgins, we'll now perform a shallow turn to the left. Notice we are using coordinated aileron and rudder. And that's how it begins. In the weeks that follow, the learning process goes on. Half a day in ground school for more of those old favorites, navigation, aerology, engines, and communications. And a half day flying to learn takeoff, landing, and precision maneuvers. And while in the primary phase, the students are formed into training squadrons, bearing colorful names and insignia would simulate the actual fleet organization. The weeks roll past quickly, and finally, that day arrives. Student and instructor fly to a small outlying field. The instructor leaves the plane, and the student moves out to solo. and takeoffs, the student returns to home base with the biggest grin he's worn since the day his girlfriend agreed to go steady. In the student quarters that night, the time-honored ceremony of necktie chopping is playfully acted out. Symbolic proof that the student has completed his solo hop and will now advance to the next phase of his flight training. During the next few weeks, the student prepares for his precision stage check. He must demonstrate his ability to fly smoothly and precisely, land in a designated area, make steep turns, and do precision maneuvers. And during this period, he begins to make up his mind in which type of Navy aircraft he would like to specialize. And when finally the orders for assignment to advanced training are posted, they are anxiously studied. For the most part, the student finds his preference will coincide with the needs of the Navy. More weeks pass. The student has now mastered all phases of the precision stage and it's moving time again. This time to another auxiliary field for transition training in the higher powered T-28. One step closer to a fleet type plane. After familiarizing the student with the basic characteristics of the new training plane, the future naval aviator starts one of the most exciting and thrilling stages of his flight training, acrobatics. Aileron rolls, loops, Immelman turns, half Cuban eights, wing overs and chandelles. All of them must be thoroughly mastered. And still there is more to learn. The student is introduced to the link trainer, a ground device which teaches him the use of the various instruments with which he can maintain control of his plane without the use of a natural horizon or visual contact with the ground. Having now become thoroughly familiar with the T-28, the student enters the tactics phase of his instruction, which includes formation and night flying, cross-country navigation and radio instruments. For high-speed coordination and aerial teamwork are essential for the day when these men will depend on each other's timing and skill in specialized fleet combat teams. The students learn to work together in many ways, not only with other young men from every state of the Union, but with student flyers from France, Mexico, and other allied nations. At this stage also, the student is given his first taste of air-to-air -air gunnery, 
shooting live ammunition at targets towed over open water. And during this period, the young naval aviator learns and practices simulated carrier tactics by making numerous approaches, landings, and takeoffs from a strip at an outlying field marked in the shape of a carrier deck. Thus, the culmination of many months of classes, training, and practice comes on the day a student actually makes his qualifying landings aboard an aircraft carrier. To those who have achieved it, a carrier landing is an unforgettable experience. Done with the help of all aboard, from landing signal officer and flight deck officer to plane handlers and gas crew. And so that night, there's a big hop at the students club to celebrate the completion of the carrier qualifications and the end of the basic training phase. Now, as the students move to their new stations to start advanced training, their individuality and personal preferences are recognized. Bill Porter, New York City. Two years at CCNY, major in engineering. Rank, NAVCAT. Destination, Corpus Christi, Texas. Advanced jet fighter training. Ted Ritter, Franklin, Michigan. BA, University of Michigan. Major in journalism. Rank, Ensign, USN. Destination, Glinko, Georgia. Dave Collins, Anaheim, California. Four years, Redlands College. Star quarterback. Rank, Ensign USNR. Destination, Ellison Field, Florida. Advanced training in helicopters. Chuck Larson, Chickasaw, Oklahoma. Graduate, Texas A&M. Sometime rodeo rider. Rank, Ensign USNR. Destination, Corpus Christi, Texas. Advanced multi-engine training. On arrival at Corpus Christi, Porter gets his first close look at the basic jet trainer. But before he is ready for his first ride, there are many new things to be learned. Along with general familiarization of jet aircraft, engineering, navigation, and gunnery, he goes for a ride in the low pressure chamber to experience the results of reduced pressure under rigidly controlled conditions. He practices emergency procedure by releasing an ejection seat on a specially designed training device. And then, in a schoolboy's dream come true, he begins jet flying in the basic two-place trainer. On the first hop or two, Porter gets the feel of the plane, radically different from anything he's flown before. But he quickly gains confidence in himself and his aircraft. And it isn't long, and he's again ready to solo. This time in the lightning-fast single-seat jet pen. Then it's tactics again. Formation work, gunnery, and the dozens of other subjects that must be mastered before he becomes a pilot with the fleet. 
And during this time, Dave Collins has been checked out in the Bell helicopter, used as a primary trainer in the helicopter training unit. After becoming accomplished in the handling and maneuvering of the single rotor model, Collins begins instruction in the fleet-type hub helicopter. And the climax of his training again comes in the form of carrier qualification in a search and rescue mission. At the same time, Chuck Larson, who has chosen multi-engine training in seaplanes at Corpus Christi, is getting his first taste and feel of the big plane. He, like the others, must readjust to flying the big planes. But not too many weeks go by, and he too becomes proficient in the control of the flying boat. And he qualifies as a junior officer aboard what many Navy men refer to as the eyes of the fleet. And finally, it's payoff day. This is a day to remember. This is a day you thought would never come. But here you are. Ensign William Porter. And there's your name being called. Congratulations, Ensign Porter. Thank you, sir. Larson graduated at Corpus Christi, Ritter at Glencoe, and Collins at Pensacola. But except for the locale, the ceremonies are much the same, colorful, dramatic, and stirring. And when they're over, there are those beautiful golden wings, the prettiest sight you've ever seen, with the possible exception of the girl who pinned them on. And so, each man rounds out his training and joins his fleet squadron. Thus, the process comes full circle. As trained pilots go out to serve with the fleet, new young men who are looking for adventure, action, and a chance to get ahead come in to earn their wings. As naval aviators, these young men will follow a proud tradition and be numbered among the men of vision, determination, and purpose who have devoted their lives to developing the sea air team our first line of national defense. I am a United States Navy flyer. My countrymen built the best airplane in the world and entrusted it to me. They trained me to fly it. I will use it to the absolute limit of my power. With my fellow pilots, air crews, and deck crews, my plane and I will do anything necessary to carry out our tremendous responsibilities. I will always remember we are part of an unbeatable combat team, the United States Navy. When the going is fast and rough, I will not falter. I will be uncompromising in every blow I strike. I will be humble in victory. I am a United States Navy flyer. I have dedicated myself to my country with its many millions of all races, colors, and creeds. They, in their way of life, are worthy of my greatest protective effort. I ask the help of God in making that effort great enough. Bring the name of the 